Hello and welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds. My name is Marie Mullaney. Today I'd like to discuss a topic that I ran out of time for in my video on polytheism. How to build a church. How to create an organization that supports your religion. What I'm going to break down today's topic into is first why a religion gets organized and what sort of levels of organization exist in various religions. Then I'm going to get down to the cases and explain how religions are organized from the spiritual through to rites and rituals through to the physical including things like church buildings, vestments, that kind of thing. And then finally, I will discuss church politics, both internal to the church and its hierarchy and external to the church and its impact on uh, governmental politics. And the last thing I'm going to do, the reason why you should watch this video all the way through to the end, is to get a breakdown of how to quickly create a engaging and realistic church. If you like this kind of content, please do hit the thumbs up button and if you really like this video you can buy me a coffee over at www.coffee.com forward slash just in time worlds link on the whiteboard let's get cracking why do religions get organized and what levels of organization exist the first thing you need to understand is that as a species we love symbology we love the effects of religion. There was a statuette discovered that's 32,000 years old and it was discovered in, in Germany in 1939 and that speaks to our species love of religion and as a species we're a hierarchical species so we tend to want to introduce organization into everything we do and that includes religion but not all religions are equally organized and the reason for that I think is dependent on intimacy. The more intimate your relationship with your deity, the less organization you need. The more remote your deity is, the more organization there tends to be. The more complex and large your society becomes, so the more organization there is around your government and your society, the more organized your religion tends to be. Shamans, for example, did little more than just organize rites like funerals and birthright ceremonies. But as our societies grew to be more complex, we introduced more complicated rites, rituals, and religion itself became a much more complicated matter with ranks. And so this gave rise to churches. In the Middle Ages, the Christian church became the overarching identity of the European uh, nobles, despite the fact that they came from different regions and perhaps answered to different people. They all saw themselves as Christian with the Pope as, the, as their leader. And this, of course, resulted in a very highly organized religion that was almost a government. And of course, the highest form of religious organization would be a theocracy. Now, I will cover theocracies in a later video where I discuss various forms of fantasy government. Suffice for this video's purpose that your organizational level goes from pretty much disorganized where you have perhaps a shaman leading local rituals to the hyper-organized theocracy where your religion also plays the role of your state. So that's your levels of organization. But how do you actually create your organization? First, you should start with your spiritual. The feeling of your God will inform your religion as a whole. Now, the easiest way to establish your spiritual is to address the big questions. In my video on Fantasy Religions 101, I spoke about religion addressing the big questions. Things like, why are we here? Where does the world come from? The answers to those questions informs the spirituality of your religion. 
If we take two gods from the Greek religion, being Hestia and Ares, you can see that their spiritualism is quite different. Hestia is the goddess of the heart. Her spirituality is one of the home and of building a family home and keeping the home fires burning. Ares is the god of war and his spirituality is all around courage and um, militaristic attitude and dying for your country. That basis of spirituality then builds into your rites and rituals. Your rites and rituals are where your religion really gets into mediating the social contract. I made a short video, one minute long, around a religion's relationship with the social contract. In your rites and rituals, this aspect of religion really comes into play where religion provides your marriage ceremony, it provides your birthright ceremonies. The spirituality of your God is going to influence what rites and rituals they have and how those rites and rituals play out. If you consider a death rite, for example, a funeral, again taking our Hestia and Ares example, Hestia's funeral rites would be about homecoming and sending your beloved off. And Ares' rites and rituals would be much more aggressive and warlike. It's also important in these rites and rituals to consider how you create such a rite in a fantasy world. What I like to do is given the spirituality of my deity, I then pick three to five of the senses to engage in a ritual and build in component, components of the ritual around those senses. So for example, uh, you, could in, you could choose to engage sight and hearing and smell. So you could have dancers and people who are chanting and then maybe some incense burning as a means to create a ritual that then speaks to the spirituality of your God. Rites and rituals also speak to physical elements of an organized religion. But they're not the only part of the physical side of organizing a religion. There are also things like buildings or holy places or places where you would go on pilgrimage. These holy places could be anything from a church building to a sacred grove. And no matter what they are, they need to have some kind of identifying char characteristics. So the Druids, for example, had their stone menors or uh, trees carved with specific sigils indicating that this was a holy glade. And of course, churches are very identifiable. So are mosques from the, the Islam religion. The other part of physical religion organization that you need to consider when you're building a church is what your priests or monks or your cloistered orders wear. This can be their clothing, but it can also be things like jewelry, specific rings, earrings, um, even something like a necklace or, or a hat can become a thing that is worn by the, by the priest which provides an identifiable measure of who they are. When you're creating these vestments, you should also take care to make sure that they are gradable in rank. And the reason why is so that if you have a difference between, say, a priest of a low rank and a priest of a high rank, you can visually show this with their vestments. Remember to take your vestments and your buildings back to your flavor. Something like Hestia's church would be much more focused around a homey feeling. Ares' church, his priests would probably bear arms or wear armor as an indication of their rank and their status. And the focus of the god being that of war. And then finally we come to the big one in building a church. Politics. So I spoke already investments about how important it is to be able to visually identify ranks. And we are, as a species, a very hierarchical species. So we will, in an organized religion, naturally have differing ranks. Not just in terms of low-ranking priests versus high-ranking priests, but also in terms of things like 
friars versus monks versus priests. A cloistered order is an order of, uh, of the religion where they withdraw from the world and they provide glory to the God in their withdrawal from their world. This is a very different part than, for example, a priest who ministers to the faithful. Now, an organized religion probably has both of those. So it's worth putting some time and effort into thinking about, does your religion have cloistered orders? Does it have lay priests or lay brothers who minister to the faithful? And does it have priests who formally give sermons and lead rites? And that's more or less how I'd split them. Now, obviously, there is also a great deal of ecclesiarchical wealth and rank that goes into the religions. Depending on your inheritance laws and whether your priests can have children or whether they are celibate, this can have quite a dramatic impact on the organization. The reason why is because ecclesiarchical wealth will often congregate inside of the religion without belonging to a specific person, which means that your leadership, your religious leader, has got enormous wealth and power while he is in the position of leadership. But once he leaves that position of leadership, all of that wealth and power reverts to the mother organization. In a religious context, all of that wealth stays within the organization and the leadership basically borrows from the organization that wealth and that power, which is a very interesting dynamic in that they only hold that power while they hold the position. Okay, so that's the basics of ranks, titles, and the different kinds of titles you can have in a religion. Let's tackle some serious politics and talk about internal politics. Religious politics inside of a church can be an absolutely fascinating plot driver. I've best seen it exercised by David Eddings in the Illinium trilogy. In the final book of the trilogy, a huge section of the book is taken up in the election of the archprelate of the Elim church. It was fascinating how engaging he made the mathematics of election and the process of protecting the people who could vote for the new archprelate. He even had armies moving on Chirilos, which is where the election took place, and how those armies impacted the election was fascinating. The whole process around the election made for a very interesting storyline. And it was all internal church politics. It was all just the politics inside the church. So that's one form of internal politics that you can use very effectively, which is the election of a leader. And quite often you would have elections as your means of selecting the next leader of, of a church, especially in a celibate order. But you can also have internal church politics around schisms and sects. And you can use these schisms and sects to highlight different forms of religion and how people interpret their religion. And I'll speak more about that on my video on monotheism. So that's internal, inside the church politics. But that's not your only form of politics, especially in a polytheistic sense. You can also do inter-church politics, where churches have disagreements with each other. I've seen this best implemented by Trudy Canavan in her book, An Age of the Five. And there it actually results in an, outright, in an outright war between the churches. You don't have to go that far. You can have it be rivalry between, the, between churches where they compete for the faithful's attention and time. But you can also have different nations go to war, go to religious war. And the last 
political aspect of churches that I want to highlight is the impact of organized religion on governmental politics. So obviously there are theocracies, but here I more want to talk about influence. Religious organizations can give governments mandate. Because of their blessing of a ruler, they can give that ruler the mandate to rule, the mandate of heaven, if you want to use a Chinese uh, influence. Kings were often anointed and crowned by the religious leaders because that would give them the right to rule. This was illustrated beautifully in Catherine Kerr's work where the king required a white horse to ride in the ceremony and the white horse had to be provided by the priests of Bell. But they basically refused to find a white horse until he had conquered the last of the rebels because it was a contested throne situation. And then once he defeated the last of the rebels who stood against him taking the throne, miraculously there appeared a white mare on the scene that he could ride in the coronation ceremony and his rule could be blessed by the priests of Bel. Without the blessing of the gods, you don't have the right to rule. And the blessing of the gods is not expressed as the god coming down to bless you, but as the church blessing your rule. Okay, so how do you quickly create a church? You want one element of dogma. So think about those big spiritual questions and come up with one quick answer to them. Why are we here? Why is there suffering? What is the purpose of life? Think of one social relationship defined by the God and come up with a right around that. Now, the big ones are birth, death, marriage, but don't restrict yourself to those. Think about things like swearing eternal friendship to each other. Think about things like Maybe a right that a soldier performs before battle in order to give himself courage to enter that battle. Think about the spiritual questions of your gods and then come up with one right where they mediate the social contract. Create one memorable thing that the priests of the god wears, whether that's a funny hat or a piece of jewelry or a specific jerkin. Remember to think about it in terms of ranking it so that if a higher rank priest wears it, it's a red stone. And if a lower rank priest wears it, it's a blue stone. Associated with that, create one intrinsic element of their religious building or place of worship. In my religion, I chose to go with every temple has a contemplation garden. Create one small schism in the church that believes something different from the mainstream of the church. Or create a rival church, whichever is more appropriate to your religion. But give something that provides some tension within your church. And then create one area where the church has a real influence on politics. And that's your quick cheats for creating a fantasy church. My name is Marie, this has been an episode of Just In Time Worlds, and I will see you on Friday to discuss monotheism in a fantasy setting.